Hello, my brothers and sisters. Minister Timothy Robinson here with another study. This one is Pray for Boldness. Um, uh, we're going to get into this study here. Pray for Boldness, uh, my brothers and sisters. Uh, Minister Timothy Robinson here with By the Grace of God Home Ministry. So we're going to get going with this. We're going to go ahead and pray and get going. Father in heaven, thank you for another opportunity to come and study the word of truth. We pray as we study together that we are encouraged, that we are enlightened in your holy scriptures. And that when we come away from this study, that we will be edified. We thank you for the gospel. And that is that Jesus Christ died, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. For the word of God says, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We thank you for salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pray for boldness. Uh, Paul says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Second Corinthians 5, 10 through 11 is what I just read. It is this urgency that drives us, as Paul wrote, to persuade men. Lost mankind has to hear the gospel of grace from us. We as members of the church, the body of Christ, are the only people who can tell the lost world about their need for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is our responsibilities as members, my brothers and sisters, of the body of Christ um, to let them know that God has already reconciled them with himself through Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 4, 14 through 21. Um, that's Second Corinthians five fourteen through twenty one. All they have to do is trust in Christ's finished cross work on Calvary. It is so simple, and people complicated. May God awaken us to the reality of these things. May we see the danger of indulging in the pleasures of the world and of the flesh, and of living for self, of neglecting the things of God. I pray that we in the body of Christ will pray for boldness. Uh, to do the service of Christ in the view of the day when we should stand before him to give an account. Unfortunately, some Christians are content with simply being saved. I am on my way to heaven. I have trusted that Jesus died for my sins. All I need to know from the Bible, I know. That's, that's a lot of uh, saints in the body of Christ uh, mentality. Um, now, please leave me alone. In other words, they never get beyond a gospel message, uh, the gospel of the grace of God. Spiritual growth requires great study and much effort. Brother, there is, let me say this, there is just too much thinking at your grace church. That's what they tell you. Um, look for books in the Bible and flipping pages just so exhausting what many tell you. That's it. They would rather attend church where the denomination preacher interprets the Bible for them, other than showing up, sitting in the pew, and shouting an occasion, Amen. Such minimal effort is all they think God requires of them. As long as they can sing, dance, tap their feet, and clap their hands, they, not, they need not bother turning Bible pages and reading Bible verses. As Christians... We know that the lost world is headed to a horrible eternity. Imagine the regret that will always bother them, the agony that will never be numb, the torment they will always endure, and the fire that will never be quenched. God's word is almost screaming of the impending judgment of lost mankind. The lake of fire of Revelation chapter 20, no one has to go there if they would just trust in the Lord Jesus for salvation. Boldness. Have you ever stood in line and looked at someone and wondered if they're saved and then did nothing else? Or did you just decide it was not right to talk to them at that time? Even the Apostle Paul asked the saints to pray that, that he would have boldness. Ephesians six nineteen through 20. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. 1 Thessalonians 2.2 2. But even after that, we had suffered before, and we were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi. We were bold 
in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Acts 14, 3, long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. It is not you, but Christ in you that does the work, my brothers and sisters. Uh, the power is not in you, but in Christ. <clears throat> it is not you, it is not I, but Christ that lives in me. Galatians 2, 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We need to get ourselves out of the way and let Christ do the work. All Christians today certainly need boldness to speak the word of God. We need to be much, much in prayer for boldness. We certainly need boldness as ambassador for Jesus Christ. Every believer today as a member of the church, which is his, which is the body of Christ, is an ambassador, 2 Corinthians 5.20. And we should expect the same treatment Paul received in a hostile world. Apostle Paul's boldness was twofold in that first, he was bold in the face of even prison and death. And second, that he was bold to preach that which was not prophesied in the Old Testament scripture, scriptures, but was revealed by the risen, but rejected Christ to him. Let us all pray for his boldness to make all men see what is the dispensation of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages had been hid in God. Ephesians 6, 19 through 20. And for me, that others may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly, to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly, as I ought to speak, things that we should pray for. Pray to speak boldly. Pray to understand what God's grace is. Pray to understand what God's will is. Seeking approval of men or God. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which will preach of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Men pleasers, they seek the approval of men above the approval of God. The rule is human beings have a propensity that welcomes the praise of their fellows. While there may be exceptions, the rule is we enjoy being complimented or honored. They adapt their message to their audience. Men pleasers deliver to their audience that which will elicit their approval. They have made this their priority. The danger is we can easily become intoxicated and consumed by this need, then crave the praise of men. The next step in this moral digression is to seek human approval as a personal priority. People pleasing. Paul says not compatible with being a servant of Christ. What does he mean by that? <clears throat> what does Paul mean by that? What do people pleasers look like? Unfortunately, there are some people who claim to labor Christians who are so interested in being respectable that they are willing to give up beliefs that they are at the very core of our faith. And most, most especially that Jesus died for our sin and was raised from the dead. Worried that someone might think them, uh, might think them backwards or foolish, they seek a place of compromise. People pleasers are willing to sacrifice even those core statements of faith, sound doctrine for the sake of respectability. As far as Paul is concerned, my brothers and sisters, you can't be a servant of Christ and be willing to take from Scripture what you want and leave the other portions of Scripture that will change the whole course of what you are teaching and preaching. There is nothing indirect about Paul's approach in chapter 1. He has already bluntly stated that some of the Galatians saints have forsaken God by following another gospel. Having outlined the false teachings within the church, he hastened to address the problem which the church seemed to have with him. 
The Judaizers could not attack the gospel Paul preached without attacking him. This they did by an assault on his character. They alleged that Paul had changed not for the better, but for the worse, and that his message was motivated by a desire to win man's approval rather than God. Such changes, such charges are implied by Paul's statement in verse 10. Paul said, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be a servant of Christ. The word now appears first in the Greek text, underscoring this emphasis. It centers upon the change in Paul since his conversion. Indeed, it almost begrudges his conversion. The charges infer that Paul once sought to please God, but now he only wishes to please men. Paul focused on this change which has occurred and upon the motive which his opponents are suggesting underlined his gospel. Paul opponents, they charged that he had thrown out the requirements which had been historically laid upon Gentile proselytes to Judaism. Now he was preaching that Gentiles could be saved apart from Judaism by mere faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They claimed that he acted not out of integrity, not out of necessity, but out of desire to gain easy converts who would be indebted to Paul and who would look upon him with favor. Paul's Judaizing opponents were slandering him and had successfully swayed public opinion against him. The substance of their attack on Paul was twofold. Paul's gospel message was man-made because if he had been if it had been from God, it would have included obedience to the law of Moses. And two, Paul is a people pleaser, meaning that by proclaiming his law-free gospel message, he is essentially telling people what they want to hear. In short, Paul's gospel message is too easy and is designed to be appealing to disobedient sinners, specifically to gain Paul's notoriety. That's what they was thinking. The issue in question is whether Paul deliberately diluted his message to suit his audience in order to gain status among them. He does turn the tables on his opponents. His conversion was not a change for the worse, but a change for the better. It was not that he had began, begun to be a man pleaser since his conversion, but that he had ceased to be so. As a zealous Pharisee, he was a man pleaser. He had not been converted, he would still be a man pleaser. Had he not been converted, he would still be a man pleaser. In verses 11 and 12, Paul gives a general answer in his own defense. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which preached by me is not according to me, to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul's motive, according to the Judaizers, were, were human. They claimed that he desired more to please men than he did to please God. Furthermore, they charged that he that the divine message had been corrupted by Paul's fallen humanity. Paul insisted that nothing could be farther from the truth. The details of his conversion and growth as a Christian and as a pastor refute the charge that he was a man pleaser. What he learned about the gospel, he learned apart from men. No one could claim more independence from human contamination of the gospel than he. Paul expounded on his argument by more specific examples. From his experience, his conversion, Galatians 1, 13 through 7, his relationship to apostles in Jerusalem, Galatians 1, 18, uh, and chapter 2, verse 10, and his and number 3, his confrontation of Peter, Galatians 2, 11 through 21, Ephesians 6, 5 through 9, servants be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and singleness of their heart. As unto Christ, not with eye service, as men please, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whosoever do, whosoever good thing, whatsoever good thing any man do it, the same shall receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters do the same thing unto them, for a burn threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven. Neither is there respect a person with him. If we want to be plain spoken, 
and unconcerned, my brothers and sisters, with pleasing men in the Pauline sense. What that means for us that we should be bold and proclaiming the good news that Jesus has died for our sins and that he has been raised from the dead for our salvation. When sound doctrine is not the desire of the heart, audience will heap up for themselves teachers and men pleasers will heap up for themselves a following. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. This caring, this craving to please an audience can quickly lead to danger, my brothers and sisters, among saints in the body of Christ. It conveys nothing substantial or scripture, only sentiment. There are men teaching error of divorce and remarriage because they want to please the world. They found a way to teach it, twist it, and spend it to make it as easy as the world expects. God requires preachers to convince, to rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. This duty is neglected by men pleasers in situations where such wouldn't be welcome. It is one thing to speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4, 15, but to speak without truth is not loving. Even if praised and applauded by men, there's the exhib exhibition of this. When preachers step so delicately, they trample over truth to keep people happy. My brothers and sisters, let me say that again. My brothers and sisters, there is this, there's the exhibition of this. It's when preachers step so delicately, they trample over truth to keep people happy. My brothers and sisters. An honest reading of first, second Timothy, and Titus can bring us to a better understanding of real preaching and to supply both motive and method to avoid the immature, frenzied work to gain the good esteem of men, leaving truth unspoken and sinners lost. Preachers who are running for office, seeking trophies from men, building an image, leading in the movement, proving their soundness by campaign, otherwise ill-motivated will will wind up withholding needed truth or twisting scripture. The response by faithful brothers should be to use every legitimate mean to stop the mouths of vain talkers. Titus 1, 9 through 13. That's Titus 1, 9 through 13. Go back and read these scriptures that I gave you in this lesson. <clears throat> Jude 3. Every preacher needs to ask himself the question stated in Galatians 1, 10. Do I seek to please men? Paul responded, for if I still please men, I will not be a servant of Christ. Get the point. The men pleased in Galatians 1.10 is not a servant of Christ. We should be bold in preaching the word of truth, rightly divided, my brothers and sisters. Pray for boldness. Pray for boldness in this sin, cursed, evil world to stand, to stand on the word of truth, rightly divided. We need to pray for boldness because Satan it's going to come after us. He's going to come after us in this spiritual warfare. If you're standing on God's word, rightly divided, and you're that ambassador for Christ, my brothers and sisters, yea, all that live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecutions, my brothers and sisters. Let us pray. Father, here we thank you for the message. We pray as those who listen in, that they were encouraged, that they were enlightened and that they were edified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.